Welcome everyone uh, to the uh, Asia Track session on MIPI I3C signal integrity challenges on DDR5 server-based platform solutions. Uh, the speakers are Azuena, um, Juan, and Nestor from Intel Corporation. Uh, Azuena is a signal integrity engineer working on Xeon-based uh, server solutions. Juan is a platform architect at Intel. And uh, Nestor is an analog engineer with uh, 10 plus years of experience in signal integrity. Uh, Ashwina, Juan, and Nestor, over to you for the presentation. Hello, my name is Juan Orozco. My co workers, Azucena Lupercio, Nestor Hernandez, and myself from Intel Corporation, will present the I3C signal integrity challenges on a DDR5 based server platform solution. The agenda for this presentation is to go over an introduction, an overview of the DR5 SPD server connectivity and bus characteristics, to review the I2C and the MIPI I3C retro compatibility challenges, to review the I3C controller and target device buffer on resistant design implications, a deep dive on the critical time margin calculation and how the different ACDC parameters impact the operating frequency of an implementation. We will show you the non-monotonic signal behavior that we observe in this application and why a slope reversal capability in the device targets were required in order to improve the timing margins and as well the logical proper functionality of the device. At the end, we will summarize all these details. So let's get started. The MIPI I3C improved interintegrated circuit interface is first introduced in a server application for the DDR5 dual inline memory module serial presence detect or the SPD beam function. Its implementation in a server by far exceeded the boost capacitance comprehended in the MIPI I3C basic specification for both the low and the high boost capacitance as this specification was defined with mobile IoT small handheld devices applications. This presentation covered the interoperability challenges that we have in a DDR5 server application because of the dynamic push-pull and open drain nature of the operating modes in an I3C basic solution. We will cover an in-deep analysis of the implications of very long PCB traces in a motherboard having more module routing branches with several loads and how all these characteristics impacted the electrical and timing parameters. The I3C communication bus specification was released by MIPI Alliance in 2016 as an improved com communication protocol compared to its predecessor I2C. But the implementation of I3C in a data center or a server application was materialized only until 2020 when we have the first DDR5 samples. The main enhancements in I3C adopted by the DDR SPD functions are, of course, the higher bit rate. I mean, we can reach theoretically up to 12.5 megahertz compared to 100 kilohertz up to 1 megahertz of an I2C SPD function in prior DDR generations. Depending on the practical implementation, we can get any range between 12.5 to 125 times higher bitrate. The better agile electrical interface, having a push-pull driver versus an open drain only buffer, it is much better for this type of implementations. The support for inbound interrooms or IBIs, which currently is not used by the DDR5 SPD right now, but we are looking to support this in the future and as well for other server use cases. The use for CCCs direct or broadcast, which provides as well benefit from communication from target devices and controller devices. And of course, the reduced interface power, which is now one volt IO. The DDR5 SPD interface transitioned from I2C to MIPI I3C based on the following requirements for the next generation DDR DIM technology. Number one, the lower IO operating voltage. I mean, we can get as low as one volt, which is in line to the advanced silicon process node. In prior generation, the DDR4 SPD was 
used as 2.5 volts IO, which is now not compatible with this advanced silicon process. And even when looking into two or four years from now, then one volt IO is what is required. The higher interface bitrate. In DDR4, we used to have them compared to five devices in a DDR5 application. In order to manage the increased number of devices, we need a higher bit rate. If you consider that we can have up to eight DIMMs per SPD segment, this would represent a total of 16 devices in a DDR4 application versus 40 devices to be managed in a DDR5 application. So it's more than double. The actual implementations we are seeing is I square C can reach up to 400 kilohertz limited by two factors, which is the open drain nature of the signal. I mean, we have problems with rise time and high boost capacitance in order to reach higher than 400 kilohertz. And the second problem is the standard I square C devices, such as I square C MOXs, are limited to 400 kilohertz. In accuracy, we are reaching anything between 8 to 12.5 megahertz in real application, depending on the number of DIMMs we have in the, in the interface. The higher bit rate as well is required in order to reduce the boot time of the computer. It will diminish the amount of time the memory reference code has to spend in the overall beam discovery process. Let's review this connectivity of the DDR5 SPD in a server motherboard. If we look at DDR4, as I mentioned, per DIMM, one is the SPD memory and temperature sensor, and the other is the registering clock driver circuit. These two devices are interconnected to the platform I2C interface via this 2.5 IO voltage to the target controller device in the platform, which could be the host CPU or the board manager controller. These devices operate in one volt or 3.3 volt, depending on the device. So there is a need of a level shifter in between. If we move to the DDR5 SPD, now you can see the platform controller, which is the CPU or the DMC, can be connected directly to the DIMM interface via the one ball I3C IOS. In the DIMM, we have five devices. One of them is the SPD I3C hub, which provides an electrical isolation between the host side interface and the local side interface on the DIMM. This isolation basically allows this controller on the platform to see the electrical load of only one device instead of the electrical load of five devices at the same time. So that helps in overall reducing the capacitance of the bus. The drawback from this approach is that SPD hub will introduce a time delay of six nanoseconds per direction or 12 nanoseconds round trip between the controller and target devices. At the end, there is a trade-off between the bus capacitance the a phone controller would have to drive versus these 12 nanoseconds delay uh, to be considered in the timing analysis. Now I will let uh, Nestor to take it from here. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for the introduction, Juan. Then let's dive into the SPD bus characteristics. Now, the main issue, as you might notice from the diagram, is that the, the where we place the the, the components, it's a really change, a real, real challenge. Why? Because the CPU and DIMMs being closer, but the BMC is up the north, right? So if you see this, the sheer size of the board is 16 by 19, which gives us a really, really big routing line that easily exceeds the 50 inches. So being the SPD, a low priority, this is routed after the PCIe, the DR, or the high speed signal. So that's the first challenge we had to, to overcome. The next challenge is how the actual connectivity is there, right? Because we have lots of branches, but you can see we have eight teams which have to be branch, and we have really, really long, long routes. So if we add up everything, like all the loads that we have for each team, all the routings, then we have around 200 paths of capacitance to, that the driver has to has to manage all the time, right? So this will leave us with the next question. How is going to be the retrocompatibility for this kind of big size bus capacitor, right? Now, the first challenge is because ITC has to be compatible with 
compatible with I2C, we had to take a, a, a deep dive into what is I2C requirement. I2C requires have an open drive buffer class and requires a strong pull up. Being an open drive requires a strong pull up to, to get this to the high low, to the low high. Now, the problem with the, the ITC is this requires a push pull buffer. That means we require a weak pull up so we can actually move the logic level. So the MIP ITC basic spec requires a dynamic pull up to control to switch between the strong pull up that requires the open drive and the weak pull up that we require for the push pull in the, the new ITC mode. So using three figures of merit for this, we can this three figures are the rise time, which is the next is the fall time and the BOL, right? So we can, you can see on the right side that the open drain has the lower value for the resistors, and then the push pull on the left side we require higher values of the resistor, right? So if we do the parallel equivalent for these two requirements, we arrive to a sweet spot. This sweet spot is around 333 ohms which give, will give us a rise time of around 75 nanoseconds. And with this pull up, we also have a, a, safe, a safe and healthy BOL value that is required to meet the highest operating frequency. Now, the arrow. The driver that has to drive, you remember, is a 200 puff bus has to be a strong driver. We require a 40 ohm strong driver, which give, will give us this kind of characteristics on the over trace lengths. Do you see when we reach the 50 inches and so on, we can see how the ROM is still managed to, to drive that capacitance, right? But we have some issues. The first issue is that the ROM will reduce the BOL. With the longest trace, we will have around 146 millivolts. And if we have a BIL threshold of 100, 300, we'll have around a margin of 150 millivolts, right? Now, the problem here is you have to notice that the current that is being used is 3.60 milliamperes, which is um, kind of not noticeable for power consumption, right? So we can limit the ROM into a max range of 4 ohms, which in, will ensure a healthy BOL and a max current of no bigger than three milliamperes. That will be the main feature for this buffer on the ITC bus design. Next, we can jump to the actual connectivity and calculations. Thank you, Nestor. Now let's talk about some critical time margin calculation. In order to uh, identify which will be the correct operating frequency for high boost capacitance systems, we will need to check the setup time margin when target device is driving to the primary device. That can be done by, follow, by the following equations. By knowing the, the transaction means made on the low part of the signal period, then we will need to subtract all the propagation delay parameters that are present on, on the full path such as the clock flight, flight time propagation delay from the primary device to the hub device, the clock propagation delay of the hub, the clock propagation delay from the hub to the target, the data TCO of the target, the data flight time from target to hub, the data propagation delay of the hub, the data flight time from hub to primary, and then the setup time of the primary device. By having in mind these equations, we can now identify which are the most critical parameters to check when we are identifying the operating frequency, such as uh, flight time that is uh, trace length dependent, the inner propagation delay of each, each device, and the kilo. On upper figure, we can see by increasing the trace length, the flight time will also increase. That means the flight time will be can be very high at high uh, trace lengths. Then the highest the propagation delay will be bigger the time margin reduction. However, increasing the T low 
can provide an extra time margin. On below figure, we have three operating frequencies, 12.5 megahertz, 10 megahertz, and 8 megahertz. The red one is the 12.5 megahertz. As you can see, even when we have very short trace lengths, the time margin is very short. That means there is not enough time to complete the signal transaction. Then for 10 megahertz, we have a wider range of solution space of about 35 inches. And finally, for 8 megahertz, there is a wide enough solution space for high capacitance boosts that we can go higher than 40 inches. Then knowing the TLO is one of the most critical parameters, then we can have into the game a three new parameters, such as duty cycle, clock digital high period, and clock high period. So increasing the duty cycle, the TLO will be reduced. That reduces also the time margin. When reducing duty cycle, the T high and T dig high are affected. That means small duty cycle can produce a not passing on the T high and T dig spec. That is, the T high minimum is 24 nanoseconds and T dig high minimum is 32 nanoseconds. So, a correct selection of duty cycle can provide an extra time margin to complete the setup transaction. This will guarantee a higher operating frequency. The non-monotonic signal behavior. A non-monotonic signal is, can be mitigated by a determination effect. That means when we have not terminated circuits, the signal bounces back and forth between the driver and the receiver. And as the signal have non-monotonicities present in there. Then the transmitter terminated circuit reduce the drive strength, increase the propagation delay, and limits buffer capabilities. This one also have non-monotonicities present. The transmitter terminated circuit redu reduce the bones in effect, but the time propagation delay is very high. In here, the blue line, there is no monotonicity is present. The slope reversal capability and timing improvement. With a non-deterministic loading on an unterminated boost, there can be reflections on the boost causing the slope reversal on the receiver signal. If we sampling on the first threshold, it is possible to filter the not monotonicities or Smith trigger inputs. By comparing the not terminated buses versus the receiver terminated, the flight time improvement is about 2.3 nanoseconds. Then comparing non-terminated circuits versus transmitter terminated, the flight time improvement is higher, about 3.9 nanoseconds. The slope reversal capability provides an additional time margin that improves the operating frequency and prevents false logic states. The summary. I3C applications in server systems such as DDR5 SPD are dealing with high boost capacitance than the maximum allowed limit assumptions in the I3C media spec, that is mostly for 12.5 megahertz capable buses. Higher boost capacitance application can be mitigated by using buffer drive strength strong open drain class for pull-up and hub insulation circuits. A dynamic pull-up operation allowed to drive the interoperability challenge between the open drain and push-pull operating modes by enabling higher operating frequencies on both modes and limiting critical parameters to meet latest specification. A strong buffer tend to increase signal energy reflections, especially in complex topologies resulting with a slope reversal condition at device inputs. The Smith trigger capable inputs are required in order to mitigate the slope reversal condition when dealing with high boost capacitance and strong buffers. 
Thank you very much. We all appreciate your attention. And now we can go ahead to the question and answer session. To start with, uh, uh, can you explain what kind of uh, load capacitance uh, did you can use or consider on the board side for this problem statement? It was like around 200 watts. Around 200 watts. Okay. Yeah. And and what what kind of trace length uh, is uh, is the solution working on? I think it was around. And do you remember the exact number of the trace length? Uh, it's about 24 inches. Yeah, 24 inches on the motherboard, and each of the dims they have a branch, right, of roughly two inches or so, right? Uh, so, so the 150 picofarad is inclusive of all dim branches and motherboard routing. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, audience, please post, please post your questions online so that I can pick it up. I don't see any questions so far. Uh, <clears throat> and and uh, what kind of frequency uh, to capacitance ratio will this will this proposed solution work? For this one, on one of the slides, is show uh, we can reach at about 10 to 8 megahertz, depending on how long do you go on platform and the combination with the number of loads. And also in the case of the teams, including the segment uh, of trace length that it is also include. So for long trace lengths, the recommendation is to not go up to 10 megahertz. Okay. Okay. Audience, please post your questions um, if there are if there are more. I have, I have one more question uh, for you folks. Uh, the main focus is uh, the slow reversal effect here caused by high, high bus capacitance, right? Is there is there a way to uh, avoid the soft slow reversal? Um, there is no way to avoid the reflections because on long trace lengths, this is a common uh, effect that, that we can see. However, we can uh, use devices that have the capability to handle this kind of non-monotonicities, um, such as the, in this case, the hub have this, this, this slope reversal capability. And also, one other thing that we can do is to uh, tuning or use the correct R on or buffer strength of the driver and that will also reduce the non-monotonicities. In addition, a series termination resistor on the receiver point uh, that also mitigates the non-monotonicities. Uh, however, that will depend of the system that we have okay. uh, and the requirements that it, 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 it has. And, and just to add on that is, um, once you try to mitigate all these um, slope reversal, the slope reversal is for the reflections on this high complex branch topology, right? And, and all these mitigations that Susana mentioned will have as well an implication how fast you can run this interface, right? Because by reducing the drive strength, then it means the buffer will be less capable to drive high boost capacitance by adding termination resistors at the receivers as well will slow down right the rise and fall times so at the end yes there are ways to mitigate slope reversal for these complex multi-point topologies but then you will have to pay the price for slowing down your interface thank you uh, I don't see any more uh, questions from the or any questions from the audience. So I'll, I'll stop with one last question then. Uh, do you have any uh, thoughts and recommendations for the ITC spec to actually take your solution from uh, beyond to beyond 10 megahertz that you are saying for your topologies? That, that's a very good um, uh, thought, uh, a very good question. In, For example, from the JEDEC point of view, right, that JEDEC adopted I3C BASIC, they are indeed adding this uh, slope reversal capability requirements on, on, on the DDR5 SPD hub. 
um, and it would be good, right, for from an I3C uh, <clears throat> group point of view, uh, having or, or adding this type of input characteristics, right? I mean, smidge trigger or slope reversal characteristics, uh, uh, so that we can make it easy or mitigate these type of problems, especially in some of these uh, complex server form factors where where the systems are just huge, right? And, and and in the future, we are looking to use I3C for other applications that I3C may be running through cables, multiple PCBs. So that is going to be very challenging from, from a signal integrity point of view. All right. Thank you, Azerna, Juan, and Nestor. Uh, uh, very good, uh, very good presentation uh, and insightful. Uh, thanks, all audience, uh, for joining the session of MEPDevCon.